name is Uriol, and I will be teaching today on quantum optomechanics. Is it not working? I think I've activated the microphone. So is that okay, or is just uh, it's now better? Okay. Uh, a bit louder. Yeah, okay. 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 So I plan to teach uh, these four hours in blocks of 50 minutes. We will do 50 minutes and then 10 minutes break, is, if that is okay with you. Uh, please ask as many questions as possible, ideally during the, the lecture, so that we can make it more, uh, more interactive. I think that would be a good idea. Okay? So let me first of all um, give, introduce myself, so give my, my email in case you want to contact me. That's at the University of Innsbruck in, in Austria. That's the email. Also, we have a research group that does theory on quantum optics and quantum nanophysics. And here is the web page. And also quite recently, we have been a bit active in the social networks, especially promoted by our students. So we have a Twitter and Instagram account. So if you want to check. just some information. Good. So then uh, the, the lectures will be on uh, quantum optomechanics. Okay. And before we start, I would like to uh, have a bit of feedback to know uh, what is your background. So first of all, uh, from the students, could you please tell me how many of you are doing currently the math? Uh, well, first, how many of you have studied physics? I assume, yeah, most of you. Good. How many of you are uh, doing the masters right right now? Okay. How many of you are doing the PhD right now? Okay. And uh, how many of you are postdocs? Okay. And uh, how many of you have never heard about optomechanics? Okay. How many of you you consider to be kind of expert in optomechanics or really know quite a lot already? Because maybe you are doing research on that. All right. Well, then I think it's kind of okay. So my uh, so the idea is I will uh, do these four hours to be pretty uh, starting from zero and very accessible for people that have never uh, heard about optomechanics, which then perhaps has the disadvantage that for the experts some of the parts might be too basic. But anyways, I always think uh, it is good to review even things that you know to understand it better. Okay, so. <clears throat> the plan of the lectures, basically, I've divided them in uh, five uh, parts. So, the plan of the lectures, they have five sections. Uh, first, we will start with uh, in, an introduction and motivation to the topic. Then section one will be on what I call closed uh, optomechanics, namely to understand the dynamics of the system in the absence of dissipation and how to describe it. Then we will discuss what happens when the system interacts with the with environment, namely it is open. 
So I call that open optomechanics. Then section three will be in, uh, devoted to a very important regime in optomechanics, which is called the driven uh, case, the driven scenario, which basically linearize the dynamics and, and you know, that is happening in most of the experiments today. So this is called the driven, in brackets, linear optomechanics. And we will conclude by applying this scenario of driven linear optomechanics to discuss the, the fact that you can actually cool to the emotional quantum ground state uh, mechanical systems using electromagnetic field radiation. So we would conclude with that about gr ground state uh, cooling. So our group is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a theory research group, but we collaborate a lot with experimentalists. So I myself, I'm not an experimentalist, but well, we are used to, to talk to them. So if also you have questions from the experimental point of view, uh, also feel free to ask, and I will do my best to, to try to answer, OK? Good. So that's the plan of the talk, these uh, four sections plus introduction. And then just for bibliography, for you to know, the. I mean, this is a very active research field, so there is a lot of material, a lot of papers. But perhaps now the most famous kind of reference is a, a, a review modern of physics called Cavity Optomechanics. This is a review modern of physics article. published in 2014, so six years ago. And since the field is very active, of course, there might be some things that here are already a bit outdated. But for uh, getting access to the basics and the background, for sure, that's a very good one. The authors are uh, two leading experimentalists and one leading theorist. So Marcus Aspelmeyer from Vienna, Tobias Kippenberg, from EPFL in Switzerland. They are both experimentalists. And uh, Florian Marquardt from the Max Planck Institute of Light in Erlangen, who is a theorist. OK, and recall, as always, this review modern of physics. These are reviews, uh, which, of course, ideally, they should be also accessible for students. But at the same time, they should be useful for uh, scientists and researchers. So they are, you know, sometimes the level is a bit high. So if you have never heard about optomechanics and you start reading that review, that might be a bit challenging in the beginning. But hopefully after these uh, five, uh, four hours, uh, this review will be even more useful, OK? Good. So then uh, let's start with the introduction and motivation to the topic. Good. So let's first of all think about uh, the name of uh, this lecture. This is called quantum optomechanics. Let's focus. I mean, quantum, we already know what it means. Probably this system will at some point behave according to the quantum, uh, according to quantum physics. But what does optomechanics mean? OK. So basically, optomechanics contains, in a sense, two words, opto and mechanics. and uh, here, what is important is that what we refer from opto, which you could think has to do with light, we should be even a bit more general. More than light, we should think this refers to the electromagnetic field, not only radiation at visible light, but it could also be radiation at, at uh, other frequencies, such as microwave frequencies. Okay? So from a more general point of view, optomechanics refers to the dynamics uh, that describe the coupling between the electromagnetic field electromagnetic field coupled 
through a mechanical motion. And of course, when we say mechanical motion, we always should understand this has to do with the motion of something that is massive. And here, the mass will be something very relevant in this field. So at the end, we want to couple the electromagnetic field to some motional degrees of freedom that, uh, that are embedded in a system that has mass. Okay, and I can already tell you, of course, you could say, well, this is quantum optics in general. Quantum optics also describes the couplings of electromagnetic field with the motion of massive particles, namely electrons and protons. That's correct. But here, as you will see in a second, has to do more with the fact that uh, this mechanical motion is related to the motion of a very big object. Okay, almost macroscopic, almost you can see with your bare eye. And that will be the main property. We want to couple the electromagnetic field with very massive objects. Okay, and for instance, just to give you a bit of intuition of how you can do that, and also to define two standard regimes in optomechanics, the so-called uh, yeah, optical, so optomechanics in the optical domain, and a typical scenario would be the following. Imagine you have a very nice... Uh, optical cavity with two very good mirrors. This one is completely fixed. Okay, but now this one can actually move because imagine it is actually connected by a spring to a, a big mass. So you have now two mirrors, but this one can vibrate. Okay, and then um, let me use some colors. Okay, and, you, and as you know, as in cavities, if you uh, solve the Maxwell equations in the presence of these boundaries, you find uh, modes, namely vibrations or states of the electromagnetic field, which are very well confined within this cavity. Okay. This will be optical light. Optical modes and in and this is what I call the electromagnetic field. Okay, some of these modes can be excited with photons and so on. And there is this mode, the, cap, the, 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 the optical field. And now you see, because this mirror can also move, that's another degree of freedom, which is mechanical. Okay, so now uh, this, has, this, thing, this mirror can vibrate, and this is the mechanical motion, the mechanical degree of freedom. Okay, and you can already guess from the physics point of view that in such a system I will definitely have some coupling between the degrees of freedom of the electromagnetic field and the degrees of freedom of this mechanical motion. Because for instance, uh, you can think it in two ways. If you have some light inside this cavity, you know light exerts pressure, okay? It carries momentum, so when photons reflect from this mirror, they impart uh, a bit of linear momentum that will shift the, posi the position of the mirror. Now, by changing the position of the mirror, you know that the resonance frequency of the cavity is also modified because the resonance frequency of a cavity depends on its length, and now its length is actually changing. And by changing the length of the cavity, maybe the, the light you were sending to the cavity is not resonant anymore, it doesn't enter, and so on. So you see that there are some intrinsic dynamics here between the electromagnetic field degrees of freedom and the mechanical motion, okay? And, uh, and that's a bit, uh, this is one particular setup. There are many in optomechanics, but the principle is always the same. You have some optical resonator whose resonance frequency can be modified by the motion of some mechanical uh, degree of freedom. Okay, that's one example. I will show you then other examples. But this is important. This typical uh, setting is in the optical scenario where there are optical modes. There is a, the same concept applies in a completely different regime, not in the optical regime, but in the microwave regime, okay? So recall optical frequencies are 10 to the 15 hertz, microwave frequencies are 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 hertz. And a tip, another scenario is you might remember from our basic lectures of circuits, that there is this uh, circuit, the so-called LC circuit, where you have an inductance and a capacitor, and the dynamics of this LC circuit 
can be described by an harmonic oscillator also. Okay? Now imagine I do the following. In this capacitor, I have two plates. And now I do the same trick as before. I allow one plate to actually move because it might be on top of a spring. So for instance, I connect one of the OK, one of the plates is actually can vibrate because it's on top of a spring, and I connect the circuit like that. Okay. So this is now an LC circuit. It's an harmonic uh, uh, it's an LC circuit where current or if you want microwave, uh, if there is some current flowing, it generates some microwave. So here you could see this is kind of a microwave cavity. And now uh, this, the resonance of this microwave cavity depends on the position of the of this plate, because if it changes, it changes the capacity, and this changes the frequency of the oscillator. Okay, and it's again the same concept. I have now uh, microwaves here. Microwave electromagnetic field coupled coupled to the motion. And, I, and this kind of somehow defines two very different uh, settings for optomechanics, either optical optomechanics or microwave optomechanics. Okay? Sometimes it has also other names. People use it electromechanics and things like that. But this is important because these are completely two different regimes. Here, the electromagnetic field has optical frequencies. Here, the electromagnetic field has uh, microwave frequencies. And I during the lectures, we will see that this uh, has important differences, not fundamentally, but in terms of experiments, because experiments here look very different than experiments done in that setting. Okay? Good. So, so at the end of the day, this is kind of just doing standard op uh, quantum optics, but now you couple electromagnetic fields to the motion of, you already see from these figures, of kind of big objects. And this is actually the distinctive or the main difference okay so the main uh, distinctive uh, difference is precisely this one that is that the mass m associated associated to mechanical motion is uh, somehow macroscopic. And here by macroscopic, we mean that the mass, for instance, if I write the mass in, in units of, at, of a single atomic mass unit, so n times an atomic mass unit, which is somehow the, the mass of a single uh, carbon atom, 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. For these objects, this n actually can be very large and depends a lot on the particular experiment, but current experiments go from masses that are relatively small, which means they contain of the order of one million of atoms, to really huge masses containing 10 to the 19 uh, atoms and even more, okay, in particular. Uh, perhaps the biggest uh, masses in which you experience optomechanics are used in, uh, in, in LIGO, in the interferometers for measuring gravitational waves, where they have suspended masses of the, of, with a mass of a kilogram, and, uh, and they basically, you know, they have to isolate them very well, and they, make, they are part of the interferometer, and, and, and the motion is affected by the, by the reflection of light, okay, in a sense. So... This, is, this spans a completely uh, large uh, parameter regime uh, in regards with masses, okay? And that's what makes this field different from quantum optics in the sense that uh, traditional quantum optics was dealing in the interaction of light with atoms that contain ma the mass of an atom, which would be of any order one. Here now you deal with way bigger, bigger masses. 
so large these objects are that sometimes you can, of course, see with your bare eye. Good. <clears throat> and important is to also to have, if you, to have this, uh, okay, to, to, to know that there is basically a plethora, a plethora of experimental configurations. where optomechanics uh, is implemented. Okay. If you search for optomechanics, you will immediately see these beautiful images of all type of different experimental uh, scenarios where people talk about optomechanics, meaning that they essentially have that. Okay. So the principle, as I said, is in all these scenarios is that the resonance, the resonance frequency of an electromagnetic field resonator depends depends on the position of, of a given mechanical oscillator. Okay. So that's always the principle. The resonance frequency of an optical resonator, which is some a space where single or few electromagnetic field modes are confined and resonate as a single harmonic oscillator. This frequency always depends on the mechanical position of, a, of a, some mechanical motion associated to some mass that is also described as an harmonic oscillator. So at the end of the day, this, as you will see in a second, is, has to do with the dynamics of few coupled harmonic oscillators. <coughs> and uh, just for instance, to give you an, an example of how you can modify these ideas with experiments that already exist. Another configuration similar to that one would be you take a cavity whose ends are fixed and you just put an electric object inside the, the, the cavity. Okay? So for instance, you put a cavity that is fixed and now you put some the electric object in the form of a pendulum which has a, is just a dielectric material that can oscillate inside the cavity. Since this is a dielectric material, and you know that the resonance frequency of an electromagnetic field resonator depends on the dielectric properties in its interior, now you see this, this cavity is vacuum everywhere, with exception of a, position, of a space of volume where there is some dielectric. Now by this moving also changes the resonance frequency, for instance, and then you would couple the light to this motion. <coughs> Here uh, also another setting is now the plates of the capacitor remain fixed but in, in the interior you also put uh, the electric object which now is vibrating because any object vibrates due to its uh, acoustic phonons. Now by these vibrations you also modify the, capaci the, ca the capacitance of this capacitor and hence you modify the resonance frequency and then you couple this mode to the vibrations of some piece of material and things like that. So this concept really appears in a multitude of different experimental uh, situations, okay? So and what we will do in this lecture is to discuss the theory that actually then basically applies to any of, of these situations. Good. So questions up to here for this introduction? All right, so this is a bit to describe what optomechanics is. Now let me tell you uh, why optomechanics is interesting. Why should you be interested in optomechanics, okay? And mainly there are three clear applications of these systems which makes them very interesting for uh, a broad community of scientists. The first one, as you can already guess from my emphasis on the big mass, has to do with uh, a bit more of a fundamental character. 
namely I call it macroscopic uh, quantum superpositions. Of course, here I described optomechanics. I didn't use the word quantum yet, but you can already guess that we use the word quantum because we will use these interactions to actually bring this mechanical motion to the quantum regime. Namely, we would like that these vibrations end up behaving according to, the quantum, according to quantum physics. And what quantum physics also allows is actually to take this mechanical mass and prepare it into a superposition state, okay, where this mass will be doing two different things at the same time, either being at one position and another, or vibrating in one way or another one, and so on, so really. And then, the, of course, there is a, a fundamental question, which is to ask whether is there any fundamental limit is there any fundamental limit in the validity of the superposition principle. Okay. Or a similar question is, uh, can arbitrarily large masses be placed uh, in a quantum superposition state. Okay, so these questions are basically motivated by pure intellectual curiosity and for the, for the, for, and you know, we as human beings, we strive always uh, for discovering things and for exploring things that we don't know. So this is, should raise the curiosity of any scientist to, 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 to think whether, you know, these questions have an answer, okay? And of course, the only thing we can do is just try to explore that, just to do experiments, see if we observe the quantum superposition principle with yet bigger and bigger masses. If this is the case, then we have an answer to this, which is no. If this is not the case, of course, that's always hard to uh, answer this because it could be that you don't observe that because uh, you are not doing the experiment correctly or you are not isolating well the system and so on. But at least if you observe superpositions with larger and larger objects, you give uh, a no answer to these questions. <coughs> and, uh, and of course, I mean, Compared to traditional quantum experiments, this is a big uh, leap in mass. So, for instance, large superpositions. So the largest mass that has been prepared in a macroscopic superposition in the context of matter wave interferometry, doing this double slit type of experiments. Today, the record was very recently achieved in Vienna by the group of Marcus Arn, and this is of the order of 10 to the 4 atomic mass units of masses that have 10 to the 4. So, you know, this explores much larger uh, regimes. So this is a bit of a fundamental question, which is actually also very relevant here in Trieste, because traditionally there was Professor Girardi who had uh, major contributions uh, regarding this question, and today there are still research groups here working on this, such as the group of Angelo Bassi with Matteo Calesso, who is also here, which uh, from the theoretical point of view uh, try to derive alternative theories to quantum physics that are consistent with quantum physics at small scales, but predict that quantum physics will break down uh, as soon as, as we understand it, as soon as the masses are sufficiently large. And these are theories that give very nice predictions. They predict you are, will not be able to prepare a quantum superposition of this mass at this scale, hence doing experiments and showing that you can, would falsify such theories, okay? So this motivates very well these questions. Another actually super interesting uh, related question is to think that uh, these objects start to be so massive that they generate a gravitational field that could be measured. Then there is also a fundamental question. If I have a mass 
that is so large that it generates a gravitational field that can be measured, what happens if this source of gravity is placed into a superposition state? What is the gravitational field that such a superposition state generates? Okay, so namely, what is the space, what is the space uh, time metric? generated by a mass in a quantum superposition state. And of course, this question is relevant because as we know, uh, unfortunately, we still don't have a unified uh, theory of gravity and quantum physics. And this somehow my approach uh, this terrain where we don't have a very well-defined uh, theory from a very different uh, regime, a very low-energy kind of experiments where you have very low-energy experiments but that nevertheless prepare a big mass into a large superposition state and then you look what is the space metric that such a superposition generates, okay? And uh, there are many people that are very interested in that. And somehow also related to that question of the interplay between gravity and quantum physics, there is also another yet very interesting question, which is whether can we entangle the motion of two massive objects using the gravitational interaction. So the idea would be, imagine you have one of these two big masses suspended Okay, they can move and now you want to entangle these motional degrees of freedom using the gravitational interaction Okay, And uh, many people uh, believe that this is a very interesting question because if you were able to entangle the mechanical motion by the gravitational interaction that they have between them, this would indicate that gravity needs to be quantized. Okay? Or otherwise, if gravity could not be quantized, it's completely a classical communication channel, then there would be no way that you can entangle the motion between massive objects. Okay? There are papers about that uh, which I can refer to but I myself am not an expert on these topics, okay? So don't expect very qualified discussions on, on this, okay? But that just motivates and at least gives a very nice figure of merit because if you now try to actually see how large the mass should be so that this entanglement is uh, generation, this interaction is large enough so that you can entangle, of course, uh, you need big masses. If you put small masses, that's impossible. Okay, and again, this hints on to exploring experimentally the interplay between quantum physics and gravity. Okay, so this is this type of questions regarding more fundamental character of why optomechanics is interesting, because it allows us to bring massive objects in the quantum regime. Good. Another uh, questions about that? Okay, so a second aspect somehow related has to do with quantum even though sometimes you might not even need quantum physics, but at least uh, to, be, to use these objects, these vibrations of massive objects as extremely good sensors. As you can already guess, that if we are doing experiments where we want to bring this mechanical motion to the quantum regime, this will require these mechanical degrees of freedom to be extremely well isolated from the environment. If they are very well isolated from the environment, this also means that as soon as the environment does something uh, that you don't expect, you will see this effect onto the motion. So they, these objects will be extremely fragile to the environment, which also means extremely sensitive. Okay? And hence, a side application of this, and many people are interested in that, is in using these optomechanical systems and it, as extremely good sensors. Okay? <coughs> so the idea is that this mechanical motion 
is ultra sensitive uh, to environment. Okay. <coughs> because a bit you see already from the physics I introduced, the idea is as soon as it displaces, so and <coughs> and it can be measured very well. Because you already see, if there is a bit of displacement under the mechanical motion, this, this changes the resonance frequency of the resonator. And of course, using electromagnetic fields, you can measure this with a lot of precision. Okay? So, <coughs> and indeed, this is a bit what is behind why these optomechanical systems are used in LIGO, because co the combination of this, of the fact that the mechanical motion is so sensitive to external perturbations, and the use of in optical or electromagnetic field interferometers leads to very good uh, sensors, and that's why they are used, for instance, at LIGO. Okay, let me raise now. Move back here. Set in combination with optical interferometry, for instance, this can lead to to something as sensitive as LIGO is. Okay, and also from a more applied point of view, maybe not so fundamental, but still very interesting. applied point of view, you can use these systems for very nice things. So imagine, imagine this typical optomechanical setting. Now I, I make the optomechanical setting like, like this. I put a cantilever, a trampoline, okay, and, and on top of the trampoline I put a mirror. Or, well, let's do it like that. Okay, I put a, a trampoline, and here uh, below the trampoline there is a mirror that connects with another one that is fixed. And then I have my nice resonator, whose frequency depends on the position. Now, now imagine that now on top of this cantilever I put a very tiny mass. Okay, something is deposited on, to on top. Uh, say a virus, or a molecule. I don't know how to plot it. Okay, whatever, some strange. I put a, mole a molecule on top. Then the mass, of course, will displace a little bit the cantilever, and this will change the resonance frequency of the resonator, which then I can measure with a lot of precision. Okay, so for instance, these systems can be used as a way to weight very tiny masses, and actually the numbers are amazing. Of you know, these are you can weight the smallest masses uh, with these type of systems. Okay, so. For instance, this allows you to make a very accurate weight of small objects. You could also use them for uh, uh, also for accelerometers because if this is now imagine the in, inside a, this this concept is inside an object that is actually moving, such as a car. Imagine no when we accelerate. This would also create displacements onto the cantilever, and you will be able to measure that with a lot of sensitivity of whether it is rotating and so on. So this same concept applies for uh, applications in accelerometry and inertial sensing in general, as well as
and also in terms of sensing can also be used for uh, fundamental applications. In particular, to measure so-called short distance, short distance forces. Okay. Also, with this concept, now imagine I do the following thought experiment. Okay, I, I put my optomechanical device here, which can be vibrating, and then I approach this mass here very close to a surface. Okay, or put it, yeah, put it like that. Very close to a surface, okay? And now, imagine that behind this surface, I either approach a mass, and this surface, imagine, is, is made of a perfect conductor, so that all these uh, Casimir forces are shielded. Then behind this wall, I just approach a mass. I approach a mass and I move it, okay? Then, of course, when I approach the mass, it generates a gravitational force to this cantilever, so it will displace it. And if this mass is approached and, and, re and removed periodically, it will give a driving force, okay? And with that, I should be able to measure gravity at short distances. And actually, this is very interesting from the fundamental point of view, because Newton's law at a scale below one millimeter has been measured really not very accurately, okay? So it is not falsified yet that Newton's law should, is way, way stronger at shorter distances than at large distances. And this is very interesting because there are many models in high energy physics, such as models in, in for instance, in extra dimensions, which has as a prediction that gravity at short distances should be way, way stronger, okay? And this has not been falsified yet. And this type of experiments could do that, okay? All right. Cool. Then the last point, uh, so there are, for, yeah, people in optomechanics always say there are these three areas of, of motivation, macroscopic quantum superpositions, uh, the area of quantum or in general sensing, and the third one has to do with uh, quantum transduction or in general. which is relevant for uh, quantum information processing. And the idea is uh, the following. The idea is for what it's meant by quantum transaction is in many applications in quantum, in the context of quantum technologies, it might be relevant to be able to couple quantum systems of very different nature, okay? because some systems are very good for doing something, other systems are better for something else, and you would like to use them both, but at some point you need to couple them. And how do you couple them, okay? So mechanical motion is a, is a very nice degree of freedom to actually couple all type of different mechanical systems, uh, different quantum systems. And I will give you some examples. So the idea is here to use the motion of some massive object to couple uh, different uh, quantum uh, systems for uh, quantum information processing, QIP. And I give you an example. Imagine you want to couple the spin degree of freedom with the emotional degree of freedom of an ion, okay? The spin degree of freedom that you might have in a solid, uh, spin like an MB center in diamond, and you want to couple it to the charge, uh, to the motion of an ion. How would you do that? Okay, as a thought experiment, imagine you could do you could use one of these nice cantilevers that is vibrating, and on one part of the cantilever I put a, a magnetic tip that generates some magnetic field lines that will couple to a single spin that is on the surface of, uh, of some solid. And on the other side uh, of the cantilever, on the other wall, I put some charges. that creates some electric field that now coupled to the motion of an ion. Okay. And that's the idea. So this now by moving, so you see as soon as the ion moves, it makes an electrostatic force 
to the, to the cantilever. The cantilever is displaced, and by being displaced, the magnetic field at the presence of the spin qubit is modified. And now, in this way, you just can couple the spin degrees of freedom to the motional degrees of freedom of an iron. And this is achieved by using uh, a, a mechanical system that needs to be in the quantum regime such that this coupling is coherent. Okay? This is the idea. And the same concept applies to many other uh, type of systems, and in particular, one that is very important is to couple electromagnetic fields but of very different frequencies. In particular, it would be super interesting to be able to couple coherently microwave fields to optical fields. Because optical fields are great to communicate over long distances because they can be put into fibers. And microwave fields inside dilution refrigerations are nice degrees of freedom to couple to superconducting qubits. So say you have now a very nice quantum computer inside a, a deal fridge made by superconducting qubits. And now you want to, after some computation, you want to send the quantum information to another computer which is in another city. You would like to do that by optical light, of course, to use the fibers. So how do you couple microwave fields to optical fields, which have very different frequency and very different nature? So then again, uh, you could think about the following device that actually is implemented experimentally, not in the form I draw it, but the concept. So to couple microwave fields, to optical conversion, you could do the following. I will basically merge these two diagrams into one. Okay, this one and this one. So now imagine you do the following. I put one of my mechanical motions like that. Okay? But this mechanical motion, uh, this mechanical object on this part will have a mirror, and on this part will have a, a conducting plate. And then that's the idea. Here you connect to an LC circuit. And this you connect to a, to a nice optical cavity. Okay. So this is so this is the thing that is moving. Okay. It's a bit it's a bit big, but you know what I mean. So it's a conducting plate. And here is a mirror. And here then you have optical waves, and here you have microwaves. Okay. And this is again a way that by coupling microwaves to the mechanical motion of this uh, system, this mechanical motion then couples to optical light. Okay. And there are experiments where basically they implement this concept. And then they can send, for instance, one, they can transfer one uh, photon in the microwave regime to a photon in the optical regime. And again, they use this motion. Okay. Good. So this, I think, gives you a fair overview of the, uh, the topic of quantum optomechanics and uh, its motivation. And uh, so I don't know if you have questions about that, because this would conclude the introduction of motivation. Are you motivated for optomechanics now after this? <laughs> Hopefully, yes. So that then the three next hours will be interesting. So now we will do then a 10 minutes break, and then we start with, with the theory. Do you have questions? Good. Well, I don't know. It's still not over. <laughs>